Hello again, it's Arimetsa from PokerIMania.com and in here we have Danita and we are talking about Danita's MTTs. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> and we had an interesting hand. I probably can post this on the forums as well, so we can think about how can we create a range for M. Ray Caron that will increase his equity and if we can create a range that can increase his equity, why doesn't the Nash calculator find the better equity option? So this is not a perfect tool, but I don't know. Perhaps if someone has Isimizer that can try out that if the three bet match makes sense, then I think it would be in, it would be interesting to compare that if there is a, just a problem with HRC and if there is that the coder is usually quite quick in fixing things and and getting stuff fixed. So, but I think that in this spot. If we three bet and this guy, we think that he's not ICM aware. If he's calling a bit too much, it will have devastating effects into our equity and into how much hands we can shove. Like even if he opens a smaller amount of hands and it's not ICM aware, it's still it's going to be it's going to be quite rough for us. Yeah. So like Ajax suited this kind of hands, we could lessen the risk by calling them and playing calling them and like good hands that are going to be good suited hands some well connected offsuit hands that we can we can play well mostly suited hands that we should call here and the hands that are really profitable we should be shoving and there's a good point in you that uh, that you pointed out on our chat that we might get slightly different results by running the simulation again. Let's see how much it differs between runs. This is always something that if you are having an idea that something with computers it's always nice that if you are having an idea I think the numbers are exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, so, so sometimes you get a bit different results. Yeah, and we can get an idea of the variance this way that if we are just running this again and again, I think that these are exactly the same again. And I know that there is sometimes there are a bit different, but yeah, maybe, maybe. And this is something, I don't think that it's going to be a huge mistake to shove here, but I think that it's just going to be better if we call. With a hand that plays well and on the flop we have a lot of options to play and even when we don't have position but we have a bigger stack, we can apply pressure on our opponent. And if we just flat call with a jack suited type of hand, like if we three bet Kannut Kaakkon said quite well earlier on in this, that there are going to almost be like opponent can play pretty well against us if he will fold all of the weaker hands, but then he's going to just carry on with the stronger hands, then it's like he's playing quite well against our three bet. And but if we are flat calling, then we are keeping all of these hands in his range. And on the flop we are we can then apply edge that we can't apply preflop since it's going to be logical for our opponent to play really well against us preflop but those options wouldn't necessarily be as logical in post op situations okay how many hands do we still have five hands Race, haste and suited. What shall we do? Uh, against passive looking guy, I think I would just like to call. Yep, haste and suited. We are having quite great options to go for it. Even against the passive guy, I think that we are making money with a call. 
There should be a note here. Can I hover over it? Ha hum. Crap. Yeah, we'll get the notes working again, everything is fine, birds are singing and... I think that Ace and Suited is quite a tight fold here, since we are having big stacks and with Ace and Suited kind of hands, the more stack size we have, the better options we have. Mm, yep. And it depends, like, if we would have antes here, I think then actually, like, if we don't have any antes, I'm just used to having, always having antes. If you're having no antes here, then it makes some sense to fold, but I think in general against this kind of a players, we can have a lot of edge on those guys post-flop, even though their range would be great against us, but I think that even when they are having position, we are having an edge on those guys post-flop. Yeah. And Antes would make some difference here. So like now our photos are 37%. If there would be the basic Antes in a six max, there would be something like 20, 24 chips more. So it would be like 33% photos that we would require here. Mm. Like I think that we are about 40 something, like about 42% against his range here something like that so we are behind his range and we are out of position but i think that there is value in playing pots with the worst opponents yeah so like even if there is that if you are having a good rig that is doing a doing a certain sizing and would would use his position but like this kind of a guy would he really use his position also, or is it likely that he's making even close to as good post decisions as you is? Nope. And these guys are like, when you are playing more pots against the weakest players on the table, you can get, you can get some more edge, even if the, uh, even if the positions you are playing are not going to be as great. Like this is more like in a vacuum, like, Holding Ace and Sudi might make sense, but if we are thinking that he's going to probably be the worst worst player on the table, then it makes sense to flat call him. Yeah, okay. Mm, King Eight suited might be a bit optimistic. Well, at least we are having stack depth, so. But this like King Eight suited is going to be, it's going to be like top twenty five percent. Actually, it's going to be, it's going to be fine. Kiss my bass. Yeah, go for it. Win the trophy out of zero point five big blinds. It's for all tournament poker. I think the smallest. Stack size that I have win uh, hyper is like 10 chips. And getting getting out of there that it's less than an ante, but still just winning enough pots in a row. And I actually remember that I have posted in my blog a session where there was a guy that played really badly before final table in an MTT. He folded like he had 1.3 big blinds and he folded his big blind just a hand before final table bubble burst. So he got to the final table with 0 0.3 big blinds and he won. <laughs> yeah. Anything can happen and like you know that he's not being not playing even that well, but he ha had an unbelievable card run and 
just one of the hands. I actually think that it was in one of our one of our MTT coachings that we saw it. One of those. Um, okay, let's get back to this King Eight Suti. Now I'm getting in a already much a story mode, and that's not going to be like we are not here for a storybook. We are here for the playbook. Okay, two colors, king eight suited. We are having backdoor, straight draw, check, check. What shall we do here? Yeah, this is a spot I'm not entirely sure about, but I think C betting is would be okay. Yeah, C betting I think C betting is going to be the optimal choice. And yeah, Kanut Kakko, I think King Eight suited is going to be going to be a standard. Standard open here. And I think the checking is not going to be the best here. We are having two guys that are likely with a loose range here, neither of them bet. So I think that the po possibility of them having an ace is going to decrease a bit and we are going to we are going to win the pots by just C betting so often that it would make the make most sense. Yeah. We are getting a flush draw. We are not exactly priced in. If we think that we are having good added equity, then then it makes sense. And then it's like check folding. I think this is mostly a hand that if we are if we are playing this hand, I think that we are, we should be C betting flop, even in a three way pot. I think that we are going to get enough folds. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think probably one of my leaks is that you, uh, often in like a three way or more pot, pot I'm like auto not C betting often if I'm not hitting anything. And I think that there is still money to be had in these pots. And if it's like, even if you don't get the money that often in a three way pot, mm. it's still going to be that there's going to be more to grab in the pot. So, yeah. And in these spots, like when you are having a backdoor draw, like you had here, it might be that if both of these guys call, it's not the end of the world for you as you might be hitting more. You might be hitting more outs that than then you are getting back a back a bigger bigger pie. So I think that in in these spots there there is still going to be value to be to be bluffing to be bluffing bluff C betting as well. Yeah. Okay. Hey, mm, Shakov. Yeah. Open. Getting one caller from the one of the weakest players on the table. Jack then deuce flop. What shall we do? Pretty easy, C bet. Yep, C bet for value. Opponent calls. Eight on the turn. What shall we do? Continue betting. Carry on value betting. We can go for half a bet. On the river, what shall we do? Yeah, betting again, but not sure what the sizing really. If we are going to go for three streets of value, then it's going to be that if we are going even slightly higher, like 200 chips here, if we are going then for about 400 chips here, the pot is 750, then we would have like 80% of the pot left for for the final move. But I think that on the river we can also we can also check, but it's going to be close. Like it's going to be close in in any case. Mm. I think probably betting is going to be be the best, but I'm unsure that do we get do we get sizably more calls if we are going to go for like 400 chips 
and trying to get just as many calls as we can out of that kind of a guy or going for a shove. I think that we are having the best hand against this kind of a guy most of the time. Yeah. So I think this is a missed value bet on the river. Mm, okay. And this is Kanut Kakkon is I think is absolutely correct here. And the reason for why we are value betting bigger in, in this case is like these are standard bet sizing that are going to be good in standard situations. But here if we are trying to shape the pot, like we are having 1700 chips. If we are going like 200 and 400, then we are having 1.1k left and pot is 1.5k on the river. So yeah. we are going to have a good, good sized pot to shove on the river. Yeah. So it, it requires a bit more pre-planning in that, that case, but I think that would be pretty close to optimal. You should race for sure, like race to 80 or something. 70 is fine. If opponent three bets, we should be calling. So, mm. okay. What shall we do when opponent opponent C bets here? Yeah, it, it seems pretty tight. I'm not not sure if I had any more sample or not. But... We can see on on the note after this. Mm -hmm. We actually pro should probably look at the previous hand's note as well. I think we missed it. Mm, yeah. I think if it, if it's if it's seven seven, then probably should just fold. I actually think that we are going to have enough enough equity here mm. to go yeah. for a call. Like every three is going to be good for us. Pretty, pretty surely, pretty much if we are hitting an ace or a king, we are not getting more out of our opponent likely, but I think that we are going to have the best hand with every ace and a king. Yeah. So we are having at least 10 outs there, then we are having backdoor outs with spades. Mm. So if you are having 27% pot odds, I think that we are, we are at least getting close to it if we are having if we are having implied odds here, it's going to be close. Probably like we are having 11 outs here, so it's like 23, 24% to, to hit any on the next turn. Like if it would be a half a bot bet, then it would be that we are, all, we are also getting the pot odds. Pot odds would be correct. Now we need some implied odds as well. But yeah. it is too suited, I think that we are just going to. And there are going to be like ace queens type of hands that opponent will will get dominated if you hit. And sometimes if opponent has queens and the king comes, he's still going to get get broke because it's going to be so hard for a random player to it's going to be so hard for a random player to get rid of a really good hand. Yeah. I think calling free flop is good. And I think that folding flop is likely going to be. I think that folding flop is right, like, slightly going. It's going to be debatable that there are merits of folding and there are merits of calling. I think that I would almost always call, but there are points to other direction as well. And this is one point in here is that if this would be like two, four, seven, then folding flop would be pretty easy. But when it's four, uh, two, four, five, then when there is an opportunity to get a tree that will increase your equity and you will get like three extra outs there. That's huge here. 
Yeah. Let's see this one as well. Should have bet river against this guy. You know it already in your analysis. So we have actually talked quite a bit of those things. But there have been some extra things that we have discussed also in this. Yeah. And so I like in, in this way. Before this I have read all these notes, but I probably don't remember all of these. Mm. And also that I thought that it's going to be better for the viewers that we don't spoil the hand beforehand. So that we are only going to look at the notes after the hand is complete. To yeah. see if there's something that we have missed. Yeah, I th think this was a misclick as well. Yeah, this should be a shove. Yeah. Should have been a standardized shove. You know it already. <laughs> There's. This is basically this is the final hand that I have planned in here. Yeah. Do you happen to have any other hands that you would like comments on? Like now there would be probably time for one more or something like that. Um, and actually, I think th or, there was a there was a good hand on the. And an analysis from Henrik. Okay. I think. Let's go through that one. That's, that should be fun. Should be fun. Oh. Deja has advertised this as the secrets of tournament poker, but it's like the secret is hard work, so... <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's that's going to be hard to still still go through. Uh, hand analysis. Let's see, let's see. Which one of these hands? It's the newest hand. UTG shove or not. And this is actually, these are good, like, people are not, like, it's not going to be fun to discuss about something, like, it's not going to be fun to try to learn about what are going to be the optimal ranges, like, in push or fold decisions. But if we can see that, like, in 5 to 10 big blind stack, 5 to 10 big blind stack depth, it's, like, one, one fourth of the money that moved in any stack depth moved from five to ten big blinds, we can see that like even improving slightly on those levels will make a lot of lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Is this shove to lose on the bubble? Ten big blinds, pocket sixes. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and I did post a reply right below. So I think it should be a shove. I think as well, like if we are having 10 big blinds, it's going to be really rarely that it's not a shove. And mm. I think the question in here is that what kind of an ICM that we are expecting here. And in an MTT or in a 180 man bubble, the uh, bubble factor is not actually that high. I think that if we are going with the standard, like something like 65 35 in this kind of a, or when there's almost full table i think that we can get quite a good approximation and it will say say to us that we can take a lot of risks and taking a lot of risk with pocket sixes is going to be good it's going to be a hand that plays well and on the bubble we are going to have a lot of on the bubble we are going to have a lot of chances in growing our stack and that's important in MTTs is to grow your stack, be on the final table more often, win more often. Like in these games, one third of the prize pool is getting to is is given to the winner. So mm. yeah, and you can shove at least pocket fives and probably pocket fours as well. Yeah, pocket fours would be good as well. I think. Agreed. Kauris has also taken taken some effort in here, so so this is just like this is probably something that we'll we need to comment on on later on that when even when it's a bubble there is not going to be a lot of there's not going to be a lot of bubble factor in this situation. Yeah. Okay. So 
that's pretty much what I. And this is mainly the bubble situation when it's only like 1.7 times your buy-in that you can get when when you are. You can only get like 1.7 times your buy-in back, so the bubble is not going to be that hard. And of course, after the bubble has burst and there's 27 players remaining, there is a almost there's a new situation where it's almost no ICM for the next two tables. Yeah. If it's not the bubble, this might even be like any pocket pair or close to any pocket pair. Yeah. If there is no ICM situation in here. Do you have any any other questions in MTTs or? Mm, I can't think of anything right now. But so. basically, if I would be like right, trying to tie this together, I'd say that if you are practicing MTTs, poker stars and the MTT sit and goes are a great way to practice. Yeah. But if you want to make money, I'd say start by trying out 888 poker and like if you you can't get all the comfort tools, tools but there's like 888 caption. That's a tool that's pretty much the same as Table Ninja or Session Lord for 888 poker. And then try to try to get stack and tile to work so that you can add a new site and Perhaps also if you like poker stars, the same tools work on poker stars FR, but on FR the average field sizes are smaller, smaller, and the ROIs are likely higher. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be that's going to be quite quite good. And what's other stuff was in in the games? It's there are going to be edges to be found by adding a limping range in in some of the late position spots. We can throw our opponents uh, we can throw our opponents risk to reward ratio out of whack, and we can also like ensure that we can play hands that are going to flop well. So there is going to be. I think there's going to be some improvement that you can make to make yourself harder to play play against in the in the 20, 10 to 20 big blind level. Mm, okay. And not just like even if you know that this is going to be plus EV to bet. Not even if you are thinking that this is plus EV to bet, then even still it's going to be. Even don't stop from the depth or don't stop for the point where it's going to be plus EV to bet, but try to go deeper in the situation that is this the most plus EV option I can make. Yeah. And it's interesting that we didn't have a lot of hands. So if we would have a lot more hands, it might be a situation that there would be something else that we would we could filter out. But that was the main point in filter hands. And, and basically also what we can find in these hands is that what we can find in these hands is mainly going to be what we can find in these hands is mainly going to be that when ICM is not going to be as important, then it's going to be when ICM is not going to be as important, then you need to be playing a bit more of these. Playing a bit more close spots like, and it's going to be really hard to adjust your mind from ICM to non-ICM if you are playing just a few times. Like if you are trying to improve your MTTs a lot, I think that it would require you to take like a week that you are playing MTTs and trying to get your mind around the non-ICM spots. Yeah. But I think this was a this was a nice session. I think that there was there was two hours. That's basically there are there is a this is an intermediate content mostly. That like you know all the basics already. You have really solid basics. 
and you should be crushing these games in my opinion already but there are like small tweaks that we can still make in in those spots that i said yeah okay do you have anything else to say here or uh well, I, I, I just want to say thanks to everyone for watching and commenting and thanks for the session. Uh, thanks for you, Danita, as well. You have been, again, you have been a great guy to have on stream. And also thanks everybody that commented for Kannut Kaakkoon especially. Really nice comments. And also Goblin Velho did some really good comments earlier on. Thank yeah. you. It's always easier for easier for us when there is an active chat and we had a lot of comments so so thanks everyone and you can see me next time in next time in may we are trying to in may we are trying to do some more content some more streams on march and april we have been concentrating on getting this getting this site update done and also there is going to be a site meeting that we are also taking the English guys here. So there's going to be the Poker Amanias forum meeting in Wednesday, week, weekend of May 20th to May 22nd. So it's going to be a two days. It's going to be a two day, uh, two day encounter in the Finnish countryside, but next to Helsinki. So it's easy to get to. And if some of our English community members are coming, we are getting, we are managing that if someone is coming, we are, we are arranging some kind of transport from airport or, or from the harbor if you are coming with the boat. So that's also an option if you like to talk about poker and don't be afraid of pins. Pins usually, usually talk pretty good English as well. So you, you probably won't won't feel alone but this is something that will happen on may we are probably trying to get some stream but i don't have any guarantees on on what we are doing in in that time since it's it can be quite hectic and on day has posted a link on the manias meeting that's great so 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 but this is all for it today and thanks for everybody for watching and if you are going to sleep, have a good night. And if you are still playing poker, may this be a winning night for you. Bye. Bye.